Okay, so I'll take my shot at answering these uh, these questions and points from the difficult client scenarios. Um, I don't have any notes. Uh, I've been doing this for 25 years with a variety of clients in a variety of situations, so I should pretty much be able to handle these. Let's see how I do. Case number one, the client who wants something done in an unreasonably short time frame. Uh, so I would say, um, you know, there really is not enough time allocated to the project to get what you want done in such a short time frame. We have a couple options. We can either bring other people on board to work, spend additional time to get things done, or we can reduce the scope of what you want to get done in order to get done in that time frame. The problem with reducing the scope, obviously, is that we might not be able to accomplish what you what you wanted in that amount of time. So we got to make a balance there uh, and see what's possible. Um, it's really, it's not much more complicated than that. Either we get more people or reduce the amount that there needs to be done. Um, let me know what you would like to do. So that's number one. Um, a couple notes on that. Um, I've actually occasionally walked away from a job because the client um, just wanted it done in a short time. I remember, I remember once at Yale, it was a redesign of a major school's website, and they, they, the time frame was really unreasonable, really unreasonable. Um, our proposal said that, we proposal we thought was a reasonable time frame. They turned us down because of that. They went with another company, and guess what happened? Not only did it take up to the time we thought it would, but take up even going further. And so um, sometimes the client just isn't realistic or really gets it. And uh, so that was the situation there. Um, so sometimes you do have to walk away you just uh, from a job if, if, if you can't meet the client's expectations. So moving on. So explain to the client why it's important to have a, a budget. You know, let's see. So this is so the preface here is that they have no idea about a budget. Um, you know, I could say, listen, I would say to the client, now you really you you haven't indicated that you have any budget for this project. The problem with that is, I mean, we could work with that, which basically means that I charge you by the hour. As we do the work, I just charge you for it. Uh, the problem there there is there's no end point. We don't know when it's going to be finished against a certain amount. You might feel at some point that it's not worth the amount of money you spent. Um, I may, frust may feel frustrated that we're not getting enough done giving the amount that you want to spend. Um, you know, you could say money is no object, um, but usually I only do that with clients that I build up a long time relationship with who really understand how I work and I understand how they work. So I suggest we just sit down and figure out what you would like to spend and see if we can do it for that amount of money. So note about that. So um, usually, like I said in my response, uh, some clients who I've worked for with for a long time, I will actually develop a relationship and then I can work sort of an hourly basis because uh, they trust me. They know that I'm not going to put more in than is required. They've seen what things cost before, like what we've done. But with a new client, that's really, really a very difficult way to work unless it's very clear what you're trying to do. Okay, next here. So the potential client says they have a budget but won't tell you what it is. Indication the client doesn't trust you, blah, 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 blah. Explain to the client why sharing a budget is an advantage. So I would say to the client, um, I understand that you don't want to share your budget at this point. I can understand that. It's you want to um, make sure that you're getting that I don't artificially inflate costs to meet what you want. Uh, however, it, it's it's hard to know how to gauge what's possible without knowing about what you want to spend. Um, it's like saying you're telling a contractor you want to build a house, but not tell them how much you want to spend, um, even though you know you've indicated you want a house that has one bedrooms, four bedrooms. At some point, there needs to be a cost factor because it determines what's possible to do to build. Um, you just have to trust me that. Um, I will um, be realistic. I'll give you the hours to break down the hours. I'll explain the profit margins and so forth so you see exactly where the money goes to. And then you can actually, might help you compare uh, my quote with other, um, with other um, 
uh, vendors you're considering working with to really compare apples with apples. So by presenting that budget number, then you can get a really see exactly what you're getting for that money rather than some sort of pie in the sky notion based on what I think it's going to cost and you have me some other idea. Um, once we've worked together for a while and built up a relationship and done other jobs, then this will be become much, become much easier. There's a trust factor. But at this point, if you let me know, then uh, I can be much more specific about um, how we can spend it and you'll know that it's being spent wisely. So point about that, I mean, this is the most common situation where in my years, you know, of, of quoting on projects where a client will say, I want to do this, and they just have, um, <clears throat> you know, they won't tell you how much they want to spend. Now, where they got the number from, who knows? Maybe it came out of some budget. Maybe someone told them about what it costs. Maybe it's based on some prior experience. And they really want to make sure they're not getting, that you're not, you know, inflating the charges to meet what you think it can spend. And this is probably the toughest one to, to sort of resolve, develop that trust relationship. And most people in this case handled it well in terms of responses. Um, so this is a hard one. Um, moving on. They want the site to be as cheap as possible or they have an extremely low budget. Uh, so explain the implications for low budget production. So I would say um, you know, I've seen everything you want to put. I've seen everything you want to put into this project to build this site, and um, um, and I know you want to spend as little money as possible. Um, but you have to understand certain places we can't cut corners, and so I want to spell them out to you, um, so you can see where you know where the money has to go, and then see what features or that. Or, or or components of this that perhaps are on the nice to have list versus the must have list and then we can go from there um, you know if you want everything for that amount of money then it means cutting corners in terms of quality maybe it can't get done the time frame you want because I can't bring on all the staff to work on it so um, but let's work with you let's sit down and figure what you need what's absolutely essential and I'll see if I can meet that um, so a note about that response. Um, I, this is another one where I've walked away from jobs where they have a very low budget and I just don't think I'm going to be able to be successful given what they want to spend and they're best going somewhere else. It's, it's, you really get into a problem with these low budget where they don't want to reduce the scope and be reasonable because you end up having cram in trying to get it done. They have an expectation you can do it and it just can spell disaster. So um, this case, you just might have to work or walk away from a job or spell it out in a way would say, this is how it has to be done. Um, let's see. <clears throat> uh, the client expects more from the project that, for more from the budget that will allow. Um, so this is about scope creep and scope. Um, so in this case, I'd say, so on working on your project, you've been adding other components that were, weren't a part of the original specification. Um, so what I want to do is I want to stop at this point and look and see why you want to add those things, um, see how they impact what you originally wanted, see if they really are absolutely necessary. Um, because if I do those, then I have to give up something else because we sort of identified what the budget is. And it's the budget is based to determine what we can do. So by adding these other components, then it impacts what we can do in the budget overall. So let's figure out what can uh, what uh, what can be added, um, whether some compromises can be made, and um, and and determine and maybe have to reevaluate the scope of the project and to see what can be done. You may have to increase the budget or give something up. Um, either way, the for me, what's important is the quality and that we get it done on time. So by adding these new components, you could compromising either of those and I don't want to see that happen for the sake of the success of the project. So note about that. So as I you know, laid it out, this is very common. The client get into a project, they get excited, they see other possibilities, they want to add new things. Um, sometimes you can say let's have a wish list, do these on another phase. Um, but this is really very important because very often with a new client, oh sure I can do that, sure I can do that. Maybe you think it's a little thing, it starts adding up and eventually you're spending a lot more time and money than you would plan. But since they added it in, if you didn't call them on it, then they think it's coming part of the project. 
because you didn't say it's going to cost more. They say, oh, can we do this? We can do that. The client doesn't know how long it takes. They might think it takes five minutes. Maybe it takes five hours. If you don't tell them, then um, they think it's not part of the project and they expect it to get done. And so after the fact, if you say, oh, by the way, when you added that, that doesn't go over well. So it's best to hit these things off when, they, when, it, when, when it happens and don't let these things grow without telling the client about it. Central point of contact. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this you know has goes to communication, which we spoke about earlier. Um, so why is essential point of contact? I think everyone handled this one pretty well, and I would say to the client, um, you know, when we start this project, it needs to be one person that I communicate with, um, who then can communicate with your whole team, um, if your whole team is allowed to send me messages and communicate, then they could be making different requests uh, without the other person knowing, and then I'm responding to that person, and I don't know if they're talking to the other person, so you end up, end up with a sort of a communication nightmare. If there's one person I can communicate with, then if all your team flows through them and you communicate those things to me and I respond, then everyone knows everyone knows what's going on you can communicate with everyone there it makes for a much better flow in terms of managing the information going back and forth um, and just makes things all uh, easier all around so point about that I mean that's pretty obvious um, although I've had clients who you know there's a small firm there's four or five people they have different needs they think it's kind of like well why should I have to represent the others that's why I sort of become the central point of contact. And what I do is I build that into the project, sort of as a communication lead for the project. Where, okay, I'll be the central point of contact, but I understand it's going to take my time to take in what everyone says, interpret it, and tell the rest of your team what other people are asking, and to sort all that out. So that can work, but it becomes part of the project. You have to factor that time in, because it does take time to manage the communication for, for the client's team. Finally, um, <coughs> the RFP and project questionnaire, and they haven't provided your request for proposal. And I don't have time to fill in your design questionnaire if you have one. Um, yeah, so how would I say this? Because it really depends what end of the stick you're on in this one. So whether you're working uh, as a client, or sometimes I've worked for the vendor in or a client who wants to create an RFP for others. So we'll go like this. So I suggest we you do a request for proposal, which outlines everything you want done. Um, we can go into the detail what has to be in there in terms of requirements, scope, schedule, and so forth. That's important for a couple reasons. <coughs> if you're going to ask other people to work on this project, I want you to, to bid on this project. I want you to get a fair comparison. So by having an RFP that you present to everybody, all the vendors, then you're getting comparing apples to apples to see how everyone responds. And so it'll make it much clearer to you that you're getting a fair comparison of what's being provided. If you call up one person and say, I want this, another person, I want that, if you're not clear and have one document to point to, it can get very uncertain. It also means when I do my, when I respond to the proposal in terms of a quote and what I expect to do, that I can specifically point out what you wanted and speak to those issues in terms of the document. <clears throat> it means that if you change it as a result of what I respond, then you can revise your document, I revise mine. And so it becomes sort of this flow, this working iteration of, of changing your proposal. I change my response. And finally, at the end, we agree on what's to be done. And you have your charter. I have my quote proposal. And then that becomes the jumping off point for going ahead and building the thing. And uh, having that document is really important to sort of stay on task, stay on budget, and so forth. And if things change, we go back and change it and adapt accordingly. But at least we have sort of that constitution, so to speak, that we're building on. And we, of course, like the constitution, we can amend it if need be. But it's important to have that, uh, that starting off point. Um, <coughs> as far as a project questionnaire, which sometimes I'll send out to people when they're asking for something. Yeah, if they're not used to doing a request for proposal, if it's a fairly simple project, then you can send a questionnaire and that works as well. But they really should fill it out to best of their ability. It's kind of like the time estimator that we talked about this week. You can give that to someone, that web time estimator on the web. Check off the things you want. That's Sometimes it's as simple as that. At least it gets the client to think about all the entities and components they have to do and have it, and, and have it documented 
Uh, so later on, there's no questions about what did you mean? I don't remember that. Why well, I wrote this down. You didn't write that down. You know, it's not worth it. Get in writing. Have everyone agree. Agree that you can change it later on, as long as everyone agrees to do that, and then go from there. So how did I do? Thank you. I mean, I thought I'd take a stab at this. Um, I didn't have any notes. I've been doing this for 25 years. Frankly, you know, without someone there talking to me, it's not it's sort of artificial. And with all of you, it's the same thing. So, uh, but this is stuff that you just comes with practice. Uh, explaining and getting difficult or explaining with clients how things can work and what the alternatives are. So thanks a lot. I hope this was helpful and um, yeah, feel free to score me. Thank you.